Um, my name is Michael O'Donovan. Um, I'm uh, head of Grassland uh, Research here in Tagus. Um, you're very welcome this morning to the um, Grassland Research um, Insight webinar. Uh, this is the um, eight month of these research webinars, uh, which have been run very successfully by our research department. Um, this is the first um, webinar where we're going to talk about grassland research, research um, grassland science research uh, insights. And um, for the next hour, um, we will uh, take you through some of the new, new, um, I suppose, new insights into our research program here in Tigus. Um, so our new research in insights, we have three weeks of, of um, research uh, webinars to go through. Um, our first uh, this week is new insights into feeding dairy cows at pasture. Uh, and this will be um, moderated. I, I will share the, 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 the webinar and Mike Deneen, uh, who's a research officer here in Tagus Moor Park, will go through some of the new insights which have been developed by himself in his PhD programme in collaboration with Cornell University um, over the last, let's say, four and a half years. Mike will take you through some of the new insights which he has developed. The next um, uh, research webinar would be on clover uh, developments uh, in two weeks' time. And then the final one would be on grass evaluation and, and grass breeding here in Tigers. So as you know, uh, Irish grassland characteristics um, you know, are very familiar to you all um, out there in the industry. You know, we're character the grassland system in Ireland is characterized by high pasture productivity potential, reasonably low uh, variability in seasonal supply and quality. And I suppose one of the key aspects of our system is that, you know, we have home produced feed, uh, produced on farm, reasonably sustainable production system. And like that's very much in line with the farm, the, the FARC uh, 2030 strategy, which was, which was um, developed late last year. However, there are uh, environmental impacts and there are consumer awarenesses that we have to um, take consideration of. And, and in the last uh, number of years, these have grown in their, in their importance. And, you know, some of those um, directives I have listed on the bottom of the slide there. And, you know, they're very much part of our research strategy and our kernel to the, to, you know, to the focuses of our research strategy going forward. You know, coming back to, you know, what we do in research, coming back to the movement of that out onto um, commercial dairy farms and into the industry, you know, really what we have to do is we have to um, control as good as, as well as we possibly can. The, the grass growth curve, which invariably is, is, is different every year and is different every week of the year. And that's one of the key challenges of a temperate grass producing uh, nation. And one of the key aspects of a research program in the last number of years has been to control the supply of that um, and to monitor the supply of that and predict the supply of that through Pasture Base Ireland and through the moist grass growth model. And a new element of that, uh, which we will you know, get a really good insight into, into this morning from, from Mike is, you know, what we need to do to um, sustain, uh, you know, uh, milk production, animal production in that grass growth curve by, you know, documenting the quality of pasture where it's limiting, where it's an excess of nutrients across that season. And, you know, I think uh, this morning you, you'll get a very, very good uh, um, outline of, of where, you know, this research is uh, going for the future. So the challenges, that, as I said, are, you know, grassland management, the supply of grass, the quality of grass. And that's, that's a big challenge uh, for us. And one, one that we're winning, one that we're winning from, from what we can, the feedback we get from, from, from PBI. Then, you know, the next issue is feeding the dairy, the dairy cow at grass or feeding the fattening animal at grass or the fattening lamb at grass. You know, how do we optimize that? The next part that we have to challenge is, you know, establishing clover in our swards and managing that clover um, uh, to maintain clover and to get the benefits from clover through the, through, through, the, through the grazing season. And then I suppose the final one, which is the overarching I suppose, aspect of the production system that needs to improve out there. You know, um, we need to move from the 24% in use efficiency at farm level 
up to closer to the levels where you can go to 40% and 50% in use efficiency. So this morning, um, this webinar will go through new insights into feeding dairy cows at pasture. I think you'll, we'll, we'll all learn a good deal from this morning. And I think it's, it's like everything, it's, it, it's, it's a new journey for Tagus, it's a new journey for Moorpark into, uh, I suppose, new feed chemistry for, 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 for grassland science. Um, Mike has done a, an extensive amount of work um, looking at the Cornell model and adapting that Cornell model to Irish grazing um, characteristics and grazing situations. You're going to get this morning a, a new, um, some new research methods. I think it's the first uh, dairy cow or maisel room and sampling methodology which was applied in the work that Mike did with Cornell. Mike is going to take you through some of the limitations that are with pasture, when they occur and how to overcome them. And I suppose, you know, what we're going to see this morning is, is as I said, it's the start of a journey. It's not the finish of it, but there will be more exper experimental work being undertaken in the department. And Mike will go through some of this work. And, the, you know, obviously this work is, is, a, is at a program level to, 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 to solve the, the, the overriding issues. So um, I suppose I won't delay any further. Um, I'm going to hand you over to, to Mike uh, and he's going to take you through for the next 40 minutes. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the program of this work. Um, I'd ask you to, if you have questions and as they come through, as they come through as Mike giving his talk, um, to write them into the uh, questions and answers of the, 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 chat, the chat area and we'll go through them at the end. We'll, we'll take the full presentation and then we'll go through them. At the end. So I'll stop sharing now, Mike, and you can start sharing. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, so, Thank you everyone this morning uh, for joining us um, and yeah over the next 45 minutes I hope to share some of the, the new insights we've um, achieved through a recent collaboration among Tigers Moor Park and Cornell University. So pasture-based systems thanks to our temperate and maritime climate here in Ireland are a very effective way of converting human inedible feed into highly nutritious food rich in essential nutrients for, for human consumption. Pasture-based systems also support a low environmental footprint and a very resilient business model for the producer and the industry as a whole. Currently, our, our pasture-based systems, uh, the main species is perennial ryegrass, thanks to its high growth rates, uh, good persistency and uh, high quality when maintained um, optimally. And uh, more recently, due to growing uh, global population and a growing demand for, for dairy products, um, these pasture-based systems have been challenged to increase their output and performance. However, uh, with this challenge, there are also growing concerns in regard to the uh, dairy industry's impact on uh, issues like diminishing water quality, loss of biodiversity, and climate change. There are a number of solutions that uh, could help overcome these concerns, such as the inclusion of white clover and other pasture species into our swards, uh, the genetic improvement of pastures, and also more strategic supplementation uh, going forward. To understand which solution may be optimal, we first need to understand what is the nutrient supply being achieved from perennial ryegrass. So what kind of nutrients are being supplied to the animal and where do they end up relative to the animal's requirement? So if we can gain a good understanding of, of nutrient supply from our perennial ryegrass, we can then refine the solutions or select the optimal solution. And through this, it can complement our perennial ryegrass and increase the overall productivity and nutrient use efficiency of our systems. So with that in mind, uh, in 2015, Chagas Moor Park began a new collaboration with uh, Professor Michael Van Amberg um, at the Department of Animal Science, Cornell University, USA. So Professor Van Amberg is a world-renowned dairy nutritionist. He's currently the gatekeeper of the Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein Systems Model, the CNCPS, which is a, a, a feed formulation model used to formulate the diets of uh, millions of lactating dairy cows around the world um, in countries like the US, Canada, uh, China, and Italy, to name a few. Uh, 
Uh, Mike is also uh, leads a very active um, feed chemistry laboratory uh, that was handed down to him from the late Peter Van Seuss. And it has a great history in um, refinement and development of new feed chemistry procedures. So our main goals for, for this program of work were to first develop new approaches uh, to grass feed analysis to help estimate the feeding value of uh, our swards. Our second goal was to see how these um, pastures interact with the ruminant and get a, a true understanding of the feeding value of, of grazed grass. And finally, we wanted to identify what may be limiting performance from these swards and identify supplementation strategies that can help complement our grazed grass. So just to recap on the specific research objectives, uh, uh, these would be the main uh, discussion points for, for the presentation. So the first objective was to apply new feed chemistry methods to see if we could get a, a greater understanding of the feeding value of our, of our swards. We then wanted to um, understand when we fed this material, how does it degrade in the rumen or how does it interact with the ruminant? And what kind of nutrients does it support? What are the supplies of amino acids? What is the energy supply for, from these swars that can be achieved? We then wanted to take this information and integrate it into the CNCPS to first develop or to first uh, evaluate the model to see how it performs and then to also potentially refine the model to help increase its prediction capability in pasture-based systems. And then finally, we wanted to integrate all this information to get a greater understanding of uh, nutrient supply to our animals and identify potential strategies that could complement our grazed grass and increase the efficiency and productivity of our systems. So starting with research objective one, the, the feed chemistry. So if you were to send a, a grass sample to the lab here in Ireland, uh, you'll typically receive back a report that states the, the crude protein, uh, the sugar concentration, a description of the fiber or the cell wall using NDF, ADF, and lignin, and an ash concentration. Also on the report, you, you usually receive an organic matter digestibility for grasses or a dry matter digestibility for grass silage. Um, OMD and DMD are a very strong variable to estimate the feeding value of pasture. However, they can sometimes mask the, um, some of the information that we can achieve from feed chemistry analysis. So for example, in recent work um, in sheep, um, Drs. Marion Beecher and Eva Lewis demonstrated that the digestibility of NDF is actually a better predictor of dry matter intake than organic matter digestibility. So we wanted to see if, if we could use more comprehensive feed chemistry to get a better understanding of our, our feed value. So within the structure of the C and CPS, it takes each of these chemical components and it breaks it down into more fractions based on how they interact with the rumen. So how they degrade in the rumen and what kind of nutrients they may supply to the animal. So you can see here for crude protein, it breaks it down into five further fractions based on their behavior. A similar approach is taken for, for the cell wall or the fiber in terms of the neutral detergent fiber, where it breaks the, the, the cell wall material into a number of different fractions based on their behavior. So using this extra information, the CNCPS then uses a, a mechanistic relationship to understand how much of the feed that is consumed, how much is ruminally fermented, generating microbial protein and, and volatile fatty acids, and how much of the feed can escape fermentation and supply nutrients for, for absorption. From this greater understanding, the model can estimate what may be limiting the animal's performance um, in, in the currency of, of metabolizable energy or metabolizable protein. So it helps us understand what's being supplied relative to the requirements and what may, may be missing from that animal's diet. So starting with the NDF or the cell wall material, in Cornell, they've recently developed a, a new method to uh, quantify the NDF digestibility using an in vitro procedure. So what it involves is, is mimicking the rumen environment um, in, a, in a glass flask. So here you can see an example of an assay we performed. Uh, the samples are kept in, in, a, in a water bath at the correct rumen temperature. 
um, and there's a supply of CO2 to keep the, the flask anaerobic. So by placing uh, our pastures into these flasks and then inoculating with rumen microbes, we can help uh, attain this extra information. So we can take the NDF material, understand how much of it is potentially digestible and how much is indigestible. And then by adding further time points, by removing these flasks at different time points across the, across the day, we can understand how much of the NDF degrades quickly, how much of the NDF degrades slowly, and again, how much is indigestible, so attaining more information. So here is an example of some of the output that we um, received uh, during uh, our work at Cornell. So on the x-axis, we have the, the time the flasks were removed from the bat, and on the y-axis, we have the residue left behind, or how, how much NDF was not digested. What we can see from this graph is that our optimally managed pastures can be extremely digestible and, and digest at a very fast rate uh, early in the time course. We also demonstrated that the pastures have a very small proportion of indigestible material uh, represented here by the 240 hour time point. To give you some context, in the orange line is a perennial ryegrass silage and you can see how it is a much slower rate of degradation compared to the, to the ryegrass pasture. And it also has a much larger indigestible um, portion of, of the NDF. So using this output, we can then uh, connect it with a mathematical model and determine how much of the NDF is in the fast pool, how much is in the slow pool, and how much is indigestible. So we use this information then to categorize or, or use this information to see if we could uh, detect differences among a number of different categories. So we broke a, a large um, data set of samples into spring, summer, autumn, and drought stressed material. And we applied this chemistry and looked at the output we received. So what the, the assay told us was that um, in terms of spring samples, they had the largest fast pool, summer and autumn were intermediate, and the drought stress material from the summer of 2018 had the smallest fast pool. In terms of the indigestible material, spring and summer had the lowest amount of indigestible material, autumn was intermediate, and drought had the highest amount of indigestible material. Finally, when we looked at the rate of degradation, so the speed at which the material degrades in the rumen, we demonstrated that spring had the fastest rate of digestion, summer and autumn intermediate, and drought the slowest. So this uh, quantification of the, of the NDF digestibility, both the amount of indigestible and the speed at which it degrades, helps us get more information on the feeding value of, of this pasture, and it'll help us understand why it, it may be a better predictor of, of things like dry matter intake or rumination in our lactating dairy cows. It can also help us understand why autumn pasture may not feed as well as spring pasture, which is a, a typical observation, and it helps us understand better the reasons or the mechanisms why. So now that we've described the NDF material more comprehensively, we also looked at the, the different crude protein fractions. So typically we just look at crude protein as a whole, and it, however it is a, is a quite crude measure and it doesn't tell us um, much about the actual behavior of the protein when it is fed. So we performed the different fractionation system and showed that over 20% of the protein in pasture is actually comprised of non-protein nitrogen. So this would have very little amino acid value to the animal. Uh, a, a very small proportion of this would be absorbed by the animal as amino acids. And we also demonstrated that over 85% of the protein is contained in the, in the cell contents which again suggests that it would be extensively degraded in the rumen and very little would escape rumen digestion and be absorbed by the animal. So this was um, suggesting um, very extensive uh, degradation in the rumen um, and it was estimating um, more comprehensively the, the potential feeding value of these swords. So with the feed chemistry described, we then wanted to move on and see if these estimations uh, were similar when we fed the material to the animal um, and could we um, understand better the nutrient supply being achieved and the microbial protein synthesis um, being produced 
when this material was fed. So our second objective was to develop a greater understanding of the feeding value of grazed grass. So to achieve this greater understanding, we needed to um, incorporate new research methods into our program at, at Chagas Moor Park. And one such method was the omasal sampling technique. The omasal sampling technique, um, what it involves is, is rumen cannulated cows. Here we have a, a cross section of the anatomy of a, um, of a dairy cow. Here you can see the, the rumen compartment, the reticulum with the honeycomb lining, the omasum compartment would be in behind here, and then the abomasum is down below. So what this technique involved was we take a sampling device and we pass it in through the rumen cannula, represented by this orange circle here. We place the sampling device down into the reticulum, and then we'd secure it into the reticulomasal orifice or the exit of the reticulorumen. The sampling device would then extend out through the rumen cannula and we connect a vacuum pump um, and take samples of what was leaving the reticular rumen across the 24 hour profile of the day. So what this technique allowed us to comprehensively understand was how much of the feed material was digesting the rumen, what type of nutrients were uh, leaving the rumen to give us an estimation of nutrient supply. And we could also understand how much microbial protein was being synthesized across the day and the amino acids flowing out of the rumen. We had a number of other additional experimental techniques. We used the, um, a double macro system to quantify how much nutrients were leaving the rumen. You can see here in the video, one of the research uh, cows consuming her fresh pasture. And here is uh, uh, the carboy of cobalt DDTA being continuously infused into the animal across the day. We also used microbial isolation procedures where we uh, distinguished between bacteria and protozoa utilizing N15 enrichment analysis. And we also performed room evacuations at the end of the sampling period where we'd empty all the material out of the rumen, weigh it, subsample, and return it all back into the animal. And this helped us understand the pool size of nutrients um, within our pasture fed cows, which is actually uh, quite limited in terms of the amount of data we, we currently have on these variables. So in terms of our experimental design, we, our objective was to understand when we fed this high quality pasture to these lactating dairy cows, how did it behave in the rumen and what kind of nutrients did it supply? So this was our first treatment, a grass only treatment. Our second treatment was grass uh, supplemented with rolled barley, which is low in, in crude protein and, and high in starch and we fed it at three and a half kgs of dry matter. So we wanted to understand when you supply extra energy to these grass only diets, what are the mechanisms behind some of the responses we typically see? So we often see um, um, large substitution effects when we uh, supplement this high quality pasture with energy dense supplements. And we also see variable milk responses. So we wanted to understand some of the mechanisms behind this. So we had 10 lactating rumen cannulated cows, all in their second lactation, about 513 kilos in body weight. And we performed the experiment from April to July in 2017. Another objective of our experiment was to get a greater understanding of the protozoal dynamics. So protozoa are an often forgotten about microbial species in the rumen. We typically are concerned with bacteria. Um, there are two main subcategories of protozoa. There are the endodidiomorphs, which you can see here when we took some rumen fluid and placed it under the microscope. So the endodidiomorphs um, are characterized by the cilia around their mouth. And you can see the, the protozoa uh, scavenging around for, for feed particles and also predating the smaller bacterial species. The second subcategory are the isotrix. And they are distinguished by the cilia all around their body. And you can see the distinct differences in, 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 um, in appearance. And, and they're quite striking to see under the microscope. So these protozoa have recently been demonstrated to um, impact rumen metabolism. And they've also been more recently demonstrated to contribute substantially to amino acid supply and unsaturated fatty acid supply. So when we were trying to quantify nutrient supply of pasture-fed cows, it was very important that we accounted for these protozoa as well as bacteria. Uh, 
So looking at the diet nutrient composition, for the next few slides, we'll be using the acronyms uh, G for grass only, and G plus RB for grass and rolled barley, as you can see here. So for our grass only diet, uh, in the in midsummer conditions, uh, the, the pasture was 16% protein on average, it was naturally low in starch, it had a, a, a moderate NDF concentration of 36%, and it was relatively high in, in sugar concentration, around 24% of the dry matter. The raw barley that we supplemented was low in protein and very high in starch, 60% starch. So when this was added to the diet, we slightly reduced the protein concentration of the diet. We drastically increased the starch, which was the major goal of adding the raw barley, and we reduced the fiber concentration and the sugar. So in terms of um, milk production and composition, when we supplemented with raw barley, there was no effect on milk solids yield. Uh, they were very similar with the grass only achieving 1.7 and the grass was raw barley, 1.65 kilos of milk solids across the experiment. We did see the typical responses in terms of milk composition when supplementing with a, a, a starchy ingredient. Uh, we saw a reduction in milk fat concentration, an increase in milk crude protein, and a reduction in milk urea and nitrogen, all typical of when you supplement with these um, high starch uh, ingredients. In terms of the NDF digestion, so for the grass only treatment, the cows achieved a, a, a strong dry matter intake of 16 kilos uh, per day. We could quantify how much NDF the cows consumed. And thanks to our omasal sampling technique, we could understand how much NDF was flowing out of the reticular rumen. From this, we could understand how much was digested, which was 4.2 kilos per day. And we could understand on a relative basis, uh, the proportion of NDF digested. So in the rumen, 72% of the NDF was digested and on a total tract basis, 83% was digested. So this, was, uh, this is a very strong um, digestive efficiency. Um, to compare it to indoor feeding systems, this would be more so in the range of 50 to 60%, whereas on a total tract basis, it'd be more so 60 to 70% NDF digestion. So this was um, concurring with our earlier objective in, in the feed chemistry analysis. So suggesting that the NDF was rapidly degradable um, from optimally uh, managed swords. An interesting visual observation, when we took uh, some of the material that was leaving the reticular rumen, you could see long vascular lignified strands left behind. So the microbial populations were literally ripping away the digestible material and had um, a very high access to digest this material um, from the immature pasture swards. When we compared um, the observations from this experiment, so the 4.2 kilos uh, digested per day to the predictions from the CNCPS when we inputted the new feed chemistry, we could see a very strong prediction capability, almost to the gram, of how much fiber was digested in the rumen. And this was very encouraging that a, a nutritional model that was primarily developed with indoor feeding systems data was able to predict this uh, unique behavior in pasture-fed animals. Uh, so it's encouraging for its potential going forward. When we added the rolled barley to the diet, we saw a large, uh, we saw an intake in dry matter intake of, of one kg per day, but we saw a large substitution effect of about 0.66. The animals achieved a slightly lower NDF intake. However, they reduced their, their fiber digestion in the rumen. We can see a 10 point reduction in rumen digestion and also just under a 10 point reduction in total tract digestion. So adding the rolled barley to the grass only diet resulted in a large substitution effect and a negative associated effect on total fiber digestion. So we wanted to understand uh, some of the mechanisms behind this reduced fiber digestion. So we had rumen pH boluses um, in, in the animals, which recorded pH across the 24 hour profile of the day. And here you can see that there was very similar uh, rumen pH among the two treatments throughout the um, experimental periods. What is also interesting is that uh, the minimum pH was around 6.2, it must be kept in mind that this was reticular rumen data. So on a rumen basis, it would be around roughly a, a minimum pH of six, but it was uh, throughout the 24 hour profile of the day, it was much higher 
than the uh, critical threshold for impact, impacting rumen fiber digestion. So it suggests that this negative associative effect was independent of, of pH. We also looked at rumen ammonia concentrations or the rumen nitrogen. And we demonstrated that adding the raw barley um, significantly reduced the rumen nitrogen uh, availability. And this may have been hampering the, the fiber digestion or contributing to it. There are other factors that deserve further investigation, such as uh, the microbial's uh, preference for substrate. So perhaps adding the starch um, caused a preference for the rumen microbes to um, um, be more, would rather the, 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 the starch digestion and, and um, move away from, from, from fiber digestion. So hopefully we can uh, delve deeper into this uh, in future experiments. Moving to uh, protein nutrition, uh, we could also measure the, the quantity and sources of protein or amino acids that were leaving uh, the reticular rumens of the animals. And we demonstrated that when we added raw barley to the diet, there was an increase in non-ammonia nitrogen outflow from the rumen. Uh, this was primarily being driven by increased microbial nitrogen um, outflow. So essentially, the, the raw barley was, um, was supporting higher microbial protein synthesis. And then as these microbial proteins uh, grew, a larger proportion flowed out of the rumen, and they're essentially having a larger amino acid supply to these animals. Another interesting observation from these measurements was that the amount of feed or endogenous and that the animals were extremely uh, dependent on the amount of microbial protein to support their uh, amino acid requirements. So this is quantified here. We can see that uh, around 88% of the amino acids flowing out of the rumen was of microbial origin, and that the, the perineal ryegrass protein that was being consumed was extremely digestible in the rumen, and a very small proportion of it escaped rumen fermentation. Another very interesting point was that in terms of the microbial supply was of protozoal origin. So it was concurring that the protozoa do substantially impact uh, amino acid supply or contribute to amino acid supply um, in these pasture fed cows. So apologies for, for the busy slide. This was just more so to show that uh, we also quantified the amino acid supply to the animals. Uh, uh, all, all 10 essential amino acids are described. And we can also see through this data that uh, the microbial protein was, the, was a very large contributor to amino acid supply in these pasture-fed cows, and only a small proportion was coming from the perineal ryegrass protein. So this data will help us going forward to understand the supply of each amino acid and help us refine our, our, our supplementation strategies going forward. So in terms of implications from this experiment, we can, um, when cows were offered high quality perennial ryegrass, uh, moderate in crude protein and low in NDF, uh, energy supplementation resulted in a high substitution rate, a low milk production response, and a negative associative effect on NDF digestion, which was independent of pH. The energy supplementation did, however, increase microbial protein synthesis and the supply of amino acids. We saw that the perineal ryegrass pasture can be extremely degradable, and this allows high dry matter intake to be achieved, and it uh, concurred with our, our feed chemistry analysis. Uh, we also demonstrated that perineal ryegrass protein is extensively degraded in the rumen, and although there may be a large amount of protein in our swards, a small proportion of it will escape the rumen and contribute to amino acid supply, and therefore the cows are extremely dependent on microbial amino acids. And finally, we demonstrated a large contribution for protozoa, which were demonstrated to grow rapidly. So now that we had described uh, comprehensively our, our feed chemistry, and we also um, attained a greater understanding of how the feed interacts with the ruminant and the type of nutrients it supplies, we wanted to integrate this information to help um, refine or develop the C and CPS. So for the sake of time this morning, we'll just uh, with the main conclusion that overall we were able to improve the ability of the model 
to predict amino acid supply in lactate and dairy cows. And we saw from a previous slide that the model was also very capable to predict NDF digestion in these pasture-fed animals, which is encouraging going forward. And we hope to further uh, evaluate this model with more and more experimental uh, data. So moving on to our final research objective, we wanted to take this uh, new insights or new understanding and integrate them together to understand what may be limiting performance of pasture-fed cows and try to identify uh, supplementation strategies that can complement graze pasture. So to recap, our, our, our new understanding was that when cows consumed perennial ryegrass, it entered into the rumen and the microbial protein attached. They uh, began to extensively and rapidly degrade this material where they themselves multiplied, uh, increasing the amount of microbial protein synthesis. And only a small proportion of the feed escaped um, rumen digestion. Both these substrates then um, leave the rumen through the reticulomasal orifice and make it to the small intestine where they can be absorbed. And we demonstrated that the pasture fed cow is extremely dependent on her microbial protein to support amino acids, whereas only a small proportion of amino acid supply was coming from the perennial ryegrass pasture. So for our next experiment, we wanted to um, understand if we increased the amount of feed amino acids being supplied to the animal, could we remove limitations um, on these animals and increase performance and efficiency? So to investigate this, we uh, performed a grazing supplementation experiment down in Chagas Clanakilty in the summer of, of 2018. We had 80 dairy um, cows, <clears throat> around 100 days in milk. We had two weeks of a covariate period where we collected background uh, data on the animals. And then we had 10 weeks of data and sample collection during the experimental period. Here you can see the 80 cows receiving their, um, their experimental treatments. And they received it twice per day after the, the morning and evening milking. In terms of the treatments, we had a perennial ryegrass only control, uh, which will be represented by grass only in the next few slides. We had perennial ryegrass supplemented with citrus pulp. So for this experiment, we wanted to avoid the negative associated effects that, that the starch was having. We moved to an ingredient that was more, um, had more soluble fiber and sugar concentration. And we fed it at a certain feeding level to try and enhance dry matter intake. We also included, included a small proportion of urea just to avoid um, low rumen ammonia concentrations. Our third treatment was perennial ryegrass with a heat treated soybean meal uh, fed at a low inclusion level. So this was to try and increase the metabolizable protein or amino acid supply from the feed. And our final treatment was perennial ryegrass um, with both ingredients combined to see if there was a, a, a combined effect of, of including both ingredients. So to just go through the reasoning behind the um, experimental diets a, a, a little more in depth. So from our, our previous uh, data, we estimated that the midsummer uh, pastures would be about 18% protein, around 35% NDF. And when we used this information and estimated the dry matter intake with the, with the uh, CNCPS, we estimated that the cows would receive about 48 um, mcals of metabolizable energy per day and around 1800 grams of metabolizable protein per day. We included the citrus pulp um, at a certain inclusion level to uh, reduce the fiber concentration of the diet and stimulate um, higher dry matter intake to increase the overall energy supply to the animals per day. As the material was fermentable in the rumen, it also was estimated to grow more microbial protein and supply higher metabolizable protein per day compared to the grass only control. When we included the rumen protected protein, we included it at a very thin, a similar energy intake as the grass only control. However, we would increase the metabolizable protein supply. So these treatments were set up so that if energy was um, uh, limiting the animals, they should respond to this citrus pulp uh, treatment. Whereas if metabolizable protein was limiting, they should equally respond to both treatments. 
For our final treatment, we use the combined effect of the citrus and the room protective protein to increase both the metabolizable energy and the metabolizable protein across the day. So unfortunately, uh, in 2018, we, Ireland experienced a, a, a severe drought. Here you can see the grass growth rate per day um, for 2018, 2017, and 2016. And you can see the drastic effect the, the drought had on uh, grass growth rate um, per day. Here's our experimental start date. And here was our experimental end date. So we hit the drought right on the money, unfortunately. So thankfully, we were able to have um, enough uh, land area to maintain um, good pre-grazing yields and, and enough pasture in the animal's diet so we could continue our experiment uh, through the drought. However, the pasture, while it was uh, still at a, a good pre-grazing yield, it was stressed from the, from the soil moisture deficit, and this affected the chemical composition of the pasture offered to the animals. So here you can see uh, the week of experiments, the, the, the week of experiment, and the crude protein concentration of the pasture across the experiment, with the blue line representing when the drought conditions were relieved and we received rain in, in Chagas Clan Kilty. So you can see at the beginning of the experiment, the crude protein was around 15%, and it dropped all the way down to 11% at the peak drought conditions before returning to more normal conditions of around 18% crude protein. It also affected the NDF concentration, where you can see elevated NDF concentrations uh, from the beginning of the experiment, uh, reaching to a peak at, at, at the peak drought conditions uh, and returning to more uh, down back to lo lower levels um, when we received the rain. And finally, the indigestible NDF from some of the new feed chemistry analysis we could perform could also detect that the uh, pastures were elevated in indigestible material from the beginning of the experiment hitting a peak during the drought and dropping back down uh, when we received the rain. So although we had adequate pasture supply, the pasture was, um, the chemical composition of the pasture was substantially affected. So looking at intake and digestibility of the animals, the grass only control achieved an intake of about 15 and a half kgs of dry matter per day, which was a, a moderate intake. When we supplemented with the citrus, we, were, we saw a 50% substitution effect and an increase in dry matter intake of two kilos per day. So we achieved our um, estimated increase in dry matter intake. To protect the protein, they achieved a similar dry matter intake as the control and the mix uh, treatment was intermediate. In terms of fiber digestion, uh, the grass only control achieved a 70% total tract fiber digestion which was lower than our Omazel experiment, where we achieved an 83% total tract digestion. And this was um, mainly due, due to the increased amount of indigestible material in the sward. In terms of the citrus, we saw a, a slight reduction in fiber digestion. And this was likely due to the low um, uh, crude protein content of the diet. We did include a, a small amount of urea to counteract this. However, we weren't anticipating the very low uh, pasture crude protein concentrations. For the room protective protein and the mix, they achieve similar uh, NDF digestibilities as the uh, grass only control. So fortunately, our um, objectives of the experiment uh, were still achieved in terms of uh, increasing the energy supply using the citrus treatment and maintaining similar energy intakes with the room and protective protein treatment. So it allowed us, while not under ideal conditions, it still allowed us to investigate our, our research objectives. So here we have the uh, weekly milk solids production across the experiment. The first line represents the grass only control. They achieved a uh, milk solid production of 1.7 kilos at the beginning of the experiment. And this production performance dropped across the experiment as we entered into the, the more severe drought conditions before slightly increasing towards the end of the experiment when we return to more typical chemical composition. You can see an overall milk solids yield of 1.4 kilos across the experiment. When we included the citrus pulp into the diet, we saw overall a, a similar uh, milk solids yield, especially at the beginning of the experiment during the drought phase 
and we saw a slight increase in performance when we returned to more typical uh, chemical composition. And this resulted in, in a low response to supplement. When we included the rumen protected protein, the uh, experimental cows outcompeted the grass only control throughout the experiment. And this resulted in a large uh, response to supplement of, of 0.2. And what was very interesting was towards the end of the experiment, when we returned to more uh, typical concentrations of protein around 18%, the animals supplemented with room protected protein still outperformed the grass only control, suggesting that amino acids were limiting these animals um, throughout the experiment. The citrus performed similarly to the room protected protein at the end of the experiment, um, likely through, through the increased microbial protein supply. So this is encouraging for us to perform uh, uh, more experiments under more typical uh, conditions to see if this um, is, is uh, repeatable or uh, if we could repeat these um, findings. Finally, the mix performed similarly to the rumen protected protein uh, throughout the experiment. It, it outperformed the grass only control and was very similar to the rumen protected protein, suggesting that the rumen protected protein was having the greater effect in terms of increasing milk soils uh, performance. So we can see here that the, the type and quantity of supplement had a, a large impact on the uh, response we saw to the supplement. So in terms of implications of, of this experiment, um, when cows were offered low quality perennial ryegrass, low on crude protein and high in the NDF, Supplementation with a fermentable carbohydrate source, uh, citrus pulp in this scenario, increased dry matter intake, but it did not affect milk solids yield. When we supplemented with the rumen protected protein source, the heat treated soybean meal, we didn't affect dry matter intake, but we did increase milk solids yield. And this indicated that the cows under these conditions were more limited than meta with, by metabolizable protein rather than metabolizable energy. Um, and this deserves more investigation in the future to see. Um, are animals consuming perennial ryegrass that may be high in protein actually uh, may be limited in amino acids at certain times in, in the year. So overall, supplementation type needs to be considered in conjunction with the pasture nutrient composition. The, the new collaboration. We first use new feed uh, chemistry procedures to more comprehensively describe uh, grazed grass and estimate its feeding value. We then uh, perform new experimental techniques to understand how this uh, material behaves in the rumen and the nutrients it supplies. And we found very strong agreement between our estimations from feed chemistry and the measurements uh, within the animal. And we also uh, discovered new understandings of, of the digestion rate of the fiber and the type of nutrients being supplied to the animal. We then integrated this information into the CNCPS and saw a strong capability of the model to predict performance, both in terms of amino acid supply and the NDF digestibility. And then we integrated all this information to identify uh, new supplementation strategies to investigate what, limit, what nutrients may be limiting animal performance um, from grazed pasture. So in terms of future work, we hope to uh, further develop these feed chemistry methods. Uh, we're currently um, developing the capability to perform the assays in Chagas Moor Park. We hope to perform further omaze of flow experiments and use this new experimental technique to understand um, the mechanisms behind increased performance from white clover. We are repeating the final experiment in Chagas Clannacilty this summer, uh, down with Brian McCarthy and Anya Murray and all the team in Clannacilty. We are actually, we've started uh, uh, some new uh, work in early lactation supplementation. So uh, Christopher Heffernan, a, a Kerry student has uh, joined forces with us to look at particularly uh, milk fat production in, in early lactation. And the component of this research is that we are out on farm on 28 uh, commercial dairy farms, collecting pasture samples across the year to understand the change in chemical composition using these new feed chemistry methods. And finally, we hope to continue development and refinement of the CNCPS. So with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge a, a lot of people. Um, this work couldn't have been done without them. It was a big, big team effort. Specifically, I'd like to thank Brian McCarthy and Pat Dillon for their great support all throughout my, my PhD. And finally, I'd like to thank the Irish Dairy Levy Fund uh, 
who uh, generously funded this uh, research and it couldn't have been performed without their support. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, Mike. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, you know, really extensive piece of research and um, a lot of it, you know, went into your PhD program. And um, I know I know you're in the big bad world where this has to be moved out onto the, um, the commercial reality of feeding cows at pasture. So we have a couple of questions here that, uh, that we'll, take, um, we'll take because you, you spoke for a good bit of time and it's important to get some interaction with the industry. And, and I suppose the first question is the question about, you know, the slow pool and fast pool and the NDF uh, digestions. Um, there's a question here about, you know, what's the difference for the slow pool data? Or can you just describe, you know, what you mean by fast pool and what you mean by slow pool in, in, in that NDF digestion? Yeah, so um, I'll, just, I'll just speak through it. Um, so it is uh, tough to comprehend on, on first glance. It's uh, new information. Um, in terms of the fast and the slow pool, what it helps us understand is um, it quantifies how much is indigestible and the speed at which it digests. Okay. Okay. And uh, sorry. There was okay. A, a slight, um, so it helps us understand um, more comprehensively how much fiber is digested in the rumen, what kind of nutrients it supports, and it gives us more information on the different pasture swords. So how they impact items like dry matter intake, rumination, and milk solid production. So it gives us um, uh, more information on top of the organic matter digestibility as to what kind of performance it can support. Yeah, and in a, in a grass silage diet, you know, okay, there's a lot more, in, uh, you know, the, deg the degradability is much slower. So what's, what's happening there, just to give us a bit more context to that compared to a perennial oil grass pasture? Yeah, so... Yeah, so from the slide, you can see that the perennial gas silage had a slower rate of degradation and a larger indigestible material. And what that essentially shows is that um, it would impact uh, dry matter intake as there'd be a larger physical fill due to the indigestible material. It would also support lower microbial protein synthesis because there is less um, fermentable carbohydrate available to grow the microbes. And ultimately, it will result in the requirement to uh, provide more concentrate supplementation to allow the animals to perform better, to, to counteract the larger indigestible portion in feed. So by keeping our perennial grass pastures in the immature state, we are allowing the fiber to be very, very digestible and help support high dry matter intakes from a forage or a pasture-only diet and support both energy supply and amino acid supply. So it helps us understand how the, the material interacts in the rumen, items like dry matter intake and nutrient supply overall. Okay, okay, very good. There's another question here, and I suppose every, everybody, every, every objective now in, 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 in animal production is to increase end use efficiency. So one of the, you know, you, you touched it, and you know, I think was in um, the second objective there. You know, the, the the crude protein content of pasture diets, the amount of uh, non ammonia nitrogen that's in those diets, and you know how how can that be better balanced? Let's say um, at different times of the year, you know, to 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 to, to take care of to, to 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 limit that in excretion that that is taking place with with that um, with with that non ammonia nitrogen. What's your what's your what's your what's your view on that? What can be done? Yeah, so it's a very important factor, uh, as you outlined there in, in the farm to fork strategies at the beginning as well. Um, we, while we do have a lot of protein in our swards, uh, our work would show that or demonstrate that it is very digestible in the rumen and very small proportions of it escape. So this may uh, result in the need for amino acid supplementation. Um, what we can hopefully achieve is that if we understand the amino acids that are limiting, we can 
incorporate them into strategic supplements, low protein supplements, and provide it to the animal with the amino acids included, which will increase overall performance at a lower nitrogen intake. So that will help us increase our, our nitrogen use efficiency. What else, the other part of it is that if we can use these techniques to understand um, like how white clover behaves um, and the amino acids it supplies, we mm. can understand uh, where the limitation is of how, how low we can try um, manage our, our, our the protein in the sward, what kind of um, factors we can do to, to reduce the protein in the sward without going too low and hampering uh, animal performance. So we try to come up with strategies that can keep um, nitrogen intake at a lower level without compromising rumen nitrogen and amino acid supply. So hopefully this work can help us further understand some of the dynamics and then help us understand what factors may help complement performance. Okay, and I suppose another question, um, going forward, probably clover has to be part of this, this compilation of amino acid supply, microbial protein supply in, 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 in these diets. What do you think that's likely to bring? Is it going? Is it likely to bring more amino acids to the diet of the of, of the animal, or, or what, what? What? What is? What is, is there going to be more available protein to the small intestine? What? What's your team? What's your thinking on that? Yeah. So, in terms of white clover, we know it can increase animal performance drastically. Um, we can see up to twenty percent increase in performance. Um, there seems to be two main reasons for, for the increase in, in performance. Firstly, is the higher dry matter intake that we achieve with white clover. Um, and some of the very good work from um, um, recently from Marianne Hurley and Deirdre Hennessy showed that um, the clover actually has a, a higher organic matter digestibility uh, and a lower NDF concentration. So this change in, in rumen digestion or greater rumen digestion compared to perennial ryegrass um, is, is kind of showing how the higher dry matter intake is achieved. This allows higher microbial protein synthesis to be, to be, to be achieved in the rumen, a higher dry matter intake. And also some of the, the French work would show that the white clover itself supports higher amino acid output at the, at the small intestine. So white clover seems to stimulate both higher intake and resulting in higher energy supply and also increased amino acid supply. So they're using this technique, we can further refine um, what may be the, the main factors increasing the performance, but uh, white clover seems to have very strong capability in increasing the performance. Okay, very well. Um, Tim Gleason has a question here. Um, the difference in degradation rates, is that due to more mature grass being in soil with soilage compared uh, and not to the insoiling process itself? Probably is due to the more the, the more indigestible repairing material than, 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 than grass pasture. Uh, another question from Patrick O'Byrne. What starch and sugar percentage would you see as a requirement in the total diet? Starch and sugar percentage. Yeah, so starch and sugar, it's an interesting one. Um, uh, there's, I suppose there's no certain requirement for, for starch or sugar. Um, you can see like in, in the US, they can run starch up to around 30% of, of the dry matter, uh, which is very high starch rates. And then other diets such as in Finland, they can have it down around 15-20%. Um, it seems to be in our pastures, it, it's very, very low and we can still achieve high performance. Um, in terms of sugar, then it, it's similar. It can vary um, in, in the U.S. diets. It can be around five or six percent of the dry matter, whereas in our pasture-fed diets, it can be around twenty-three to twenty-five percent. So I suppose combined, there is a certain threshold you don't want to pass, um, and this uh, different factors are used to, to to estimate this. And I suppose overall, we just don't want to push it too far, where we're having very large uh, volatile fatty acid and lactic acid production in the rumen and hampering rumen pH. So combined, we want to keep them around 30, below 35%. Uh, and again, it all depends on, on fiber concentrations in the diet and the digestibility of the fiber as well. Um, John Flynn is asking, is there um, plans to use heat-treated rapeseed meal rather than heat-treated soya? Um, it's an obvious question from a sustainability perspective. You know, is, is there other options bar heat-treated soya? Yeah, so definitely very good question and very relevant. Um, I suppose 
for the inclusion of the of the heat shield soybean meal, it was more so a proof of concept. We were trying to understand if we manipulate nutrient supply, how does the animal respond and how does performance respond? And there's definitely potential to replace the, the, the heat treated soybean meal with heat treated rapeseed. But I suppose ultimately what we try to achieve is to really understand um, which amino acid may be the one limiting performance if amino acids are limiting performance. And from there, we could then take the specific amino acids, include them into a low protein supplement, such as maize or, or cereals or a digestible fiber source, and really bring down the, the nitrogen intake from the, from the supplement to help increase the nitrogen use efficiency. So and at the kind, moment, we're kind of at the proof of concept stage. That kind of leads on to the next question from yeah. Des Brennan. You know, if you're supplement with low protein rations um, with amino acids, uh, and you kind of answered it there, but this is asking: Should protected methionine or lysine should should uh, should they be should they be options? What your what you're thinking on that? Are are you still yeah, have so, the profile? Yeah. So so I suppose there there is some past work performed in, in Moor Park um, with Bridget Lynch's work in the past. Um, it was in later lactation, and we didn't see a great response to methionine or lysine. Um, mm. However, our, our grass management uh, has progressed and our pastures have increased in digestibility. So um, in terms of the, the, the rate at which the protein degrades may uh, change the response to amino acids. Um, what we were still at the proof of concept, we used the heat treated soybean meal to see if we supply all amino acids, do the animals respond? And the next stage of the research would be to see if we include specific amino acids, can we increase performance? So it's likely, uh, again, it's dependent on the pasture composition, the time of year in terms of the animals requirements. And there's a lot of complexity there, but we're, uh, we're hoping to delve into some of that work. Uh, typically, it's thought that energy is, is usually the main limitation to pasture. We're, we're hoping now to delve into may amino acids be limiting uh, performance at certain times of the year and either rule it in or rule it out if we need to consider it, especially when we go to these low crude protein supplements. Do you, do you think pasture could be lim limited in certain amino acids all through the year or do you think there's a seasonal effect of it? I think there's a there's definitely a seasonal effect. Um, we can see crude protein changes drastically across the year. It can be very high in spring and autumn and, and drop down during the summer. And also the animals' requirements change. So when they're in peak production in the spring, they have higher uh, amino acid requirements, a higher milk protein output. So I think it's going to be a dynamic and change across the year, both in the, the nutrient composition of the pasture and the animals' requirements. And we hope to perform these experiments uh, so far, we've just done a mid-season one. We hope to perform them in the spring, summer, and autumn to capture all that variation. There's two questions here from Michael Dorn. Um, one is, any issues with high nitrogen levels in spring grass? Uh, and if, if we use clover, are they going to, be, are they going to drive up further? Uh, and, and you can, the second question is, 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 is probably lined up with Chris Hef Chris, Christopher Heffern's, Heffernan's work uh, as regards second rotation, pasture and impact on, on, on butterfat drops. Um, so, so the first one, first, Mike, first rotation pasture, high levels of crude protein um, and clover, is, is that going to go up any further? Any issues with that? And then, and then the, 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 let's say the milk fat stuff with, with uh, Chris Heffernan's work, what have you found on that to date? Okay. Um, so in terms of the, the, the nitrogen content in the spring, um, it can have uh, important ramifications. Um, if we have uh, very high nitrogen concentrations in the spring, we could have low nitrogen use efficiency. And we know the, the, the issues there in terms of uh, water quality that we're trying to, to mitigate. Um, in terms of um, overall performance, it doesn't seem to uh, limit uh, performance in terms of um, ex excess protein. Uh, the cows will... Um, converted to urea and urinated out um, any excess protein. Um, they'll also secrete some of it in the milk as milk urea nitrogen. And this can have impacts on, on product quality and heat stability. So we do need to do some more work and just um, ensure that um, uh, protein concentrations aren't uh, extremely high in the spring. One note uh, important to consider is that in the first round or the early spring, 
we're usually supplementing with a, a certain level of concentrate and grass silage, which are, are usually low in, in, in protein. So we would be bringing down the overall protein of the diet in that early first round like, um, rotation where the grass protein can be very high. Uh, but there is potential there to really refine um, the, the protein concentration of, 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 the, of the concentrates, do some feed analysis on the silage and balance that diet potentially a little stronger. Um, and clover, uh, clover, it can have a, an effect on, on protein concentration in the grass. And um, I suppose in that early first round, the contribution from clover mightn't be a whole lot as it takes that little bit longer of time to uh, increase its, its, its concentration in the, in the sward. In terms of the milk fat, um, the connection was a little unstable. I think I caught it. But um, yeah, we're, we're investigating, we're starting new work into, into milk fat production. Uh, Christopher Heffernan, a student from Kerry, has, has joined with us and um, has got, really got up and running uh, right off the bat. Um, we're about to start an experiment in Kilwart, where we're looking at the effect of concentrate level. And then we're also changing the, the composition of that concentrate, including a fiber source or a protected fat source to see if we can mitigate some of the uh, typical drop we may see in, in milk fat. Um, we're also out on farm um, on the 28 uh, dairy farms that are thankfully participating with us. And we're looking at the change in grass composition across the year to see if um, some chemical uh, components are contributing to, to the drop in, in milk fat. So we're trying to quantify what happens to the fiber concentration in the grass, what happens to the fat composition and the fat levels in the grass, uh, and try to get an overall more uh, a data-driven approach of what may be, may be reducing uh, the milk fat. From some work with, with pasture-based Ireland, looking at the milk composition data, we do see a, a slight drop in milk fat, but it's not a very severe when, um, when, when it's typically a, a large portion of pasture in the diet. So overall, it's early days in the, in the program, and we're hoping to put more data to, uh, to try to understand further some of this uh, milk fat um, a reduction uh, discussion. So hopefully we'll have new data uh, soon to, to provide more clarity on the issue. Yeah, very well. So the last question here, um, we, 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 might get under, we might get into a bit of trouble for running over time, Mike, but we won't mind about that. Um, you mentioned uh, from Liam Brady, um, low ammonia levels in the rumen may reduce rumen digestion by the addition of supplements. What caused the low ammonia levels and Better utilization, better utilization of nitrogen in the rumen by the microbes, is it due to higher energy levels present? So I suppose what's causing the, um, the, low, the low ammonia levels? Yeah, so rumen pneumonia is, is um, related to a number of things, uh, primarily nitrogen intake or protein intake, and also the amount of fermentable carbohydrate uh, being supplied. So. In our uh, experiments, uh, for the Omazel experiment, the pasture was around 16% protein. When we added the rolled barley, uh, we dropped down to 15% protein, um, which is around the threshold of where you may run into uh, issues with room pneumonia levels. So we reduced both nitrogen intake and we also supplied more uh, fermentable carbohydrate to, to the rumen of those cows. So what the fermentable carbohydrate was doing was that it was stimulating more microbial protein synthesis, and they sucked up more of the rumen nitrogen to, uh, to, to use the nitrogen for their own purposes for protein, um, for protein synthesis and, and growth. So um, there's an, usually with pasture-based systems, we, we typically think we're far above that uh, rumen ammonia threshold, but you can see that in, in both experiments, I know the second experiment was in drought conditions, but we both both of those experiments, we ran close to the level of, of, of room pneumonia, uh, the threshold where we can impact fiber digestion. So it's important to keep an eye on it. Um, through feed chemistry analysis, we can see what the protein concentration of the swards are across the year and understand uh, what the animal's room and ammonia concentration may be. We do want to keep that close to the threshold because as we increase it uh, beyond uh, the threshold, uh, the animals will become less efficient with nitrogen and, and excrete it in the in the urine are secreted in the milk as, as milk urine nitrogen so um, for our experiments it seemed to be the lower pasture protein concentrations and the addition of the fermentable carbohydrate sucked up more of the nitrogen bringing that total rumen ammonia level uh, down towards the threshold okay okay i think um we, we better we have we've 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 dealt with all the questions that have come through this morning 
I think if there's any other further follow on questions that um, your email uh, is, is uh, it's Mike Deneen, Mike, Mike, Michael dot Deneen at tagus.ie or, or send it to myself, Michael dot at tagus.ie and we'll endeavor to uh, answer them. I think um, this morning, I'm, I want to thank Mike for, you know, for a really um, informative um, uh, webinar. I think we, we probably uh, are entering a new phase, a new challenge in, 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 in dairy cow nutrition. I think um, we probably are now at a phase where we have a lot of the tools and a lot of the methodologies uh, well set out uh, to, to, to manage that challenge. Um, uh, if, if we weren't in COVID times, we probably would be having um, uh, uh, an open day probably in July that might that maybe go, go later to uh, later on the year. But um, we would definitely, uh, I think, Mike, we would definitely encourage uh, any industry interaction with yourself um, to follow on in the follow on this webinar. And if people have any insights into what you presented this morning or, or any further views of it, I think we would we'd encourage um, them to bring them forward. And You've got a fairly extensive um, uh, program ongoing. As we just said, this is just a PhD, but you know, for the program, you, you have a very extensive program going forward for 2021 and for the for the coming years. So um, it won't be the last you'll hear about uh, this uh, this uh, dairy nutrition program. So with that, I, I'll thank everybody who has attended this morning. Um, uh, thanks for the, the for to Anne Kane. Uh, Siobhan Dermody and uh, Jane Cavanagh for organising this and uh, we look forward to maybe meeting you all again in, in two weeks time and thanks very much to Mike for, 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 for a really good, um, really good presentation. Thanks very much and I will uh,